So my name is Michael Okoma and I am a Nigerian researcher and content creator. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. And well you could throw in human rights activists in there as well so i was born in enugu nigeria and that is a city where i grew up and where i still live till date so i think i pride myself in saying i'm nigerian true and true because a lot of the work i have done have revolved around uh trying to make nigeria a better place uh through the development sector so I have done a lot of work with uh, young people, especially in the areas of peace building, conflict resolution, uh, crime prevention. I have done quite some work uh, with the criminal justice institutions in Nigeria, uh, trying to improve the system, uh, facilitate reforms, and ensure that uh, we can have a Nigeria that we're all uh, kind of proud about. So... I did not always, you know, uh, start off as a human rights activist. As a matter of fact, uh, my training would surprise a lot of persons because uh, I was in the basic medical sciences back in my university days and I got degrees in human anatomy and uh, public health education. Uh, but uh, somewhere along the line, uh, on the innermost part of my being, I've always uh, wanted to you know, be the one who speaks up uh, for change in the society. I've always wanted to, you know, research into uh, some of the causes of things because, you know, growing up, we always wanted to know why does this exist? Why are things the way they are? Why can things not be different? And uh, some of those questions uh, have stuck in my head and have refused to go away even as I grew older. So uh, somewhere I have learned to tackle uh, some of these uh, crazy thoughts. You know, we had growing up is trying to research, trying to read up, uh, trying to find out, you know, from persons who know better, and trying to look at phenomena that exists in nature. It kind of uh, helps me understand the world better, helps me understand people better. And I think that is the the force that wants me to do more you know it's a force that wow that is very interesting michael now can you share with me how you got started in your research projects so i guess like i guess like most people you know we are in universities trying to figure out what the rest of our lives hold and uh, i think it was in my 300 level and i was thinking to myself you know after university what next uh i didn't want to be an anatomist (laughs) yeah that's a crazy thing to say uh so my parents wanted me to be a doctor right i wanted to be you know some form of scientist i wanted to work in the lab you know do some stuff because i remember filling out my first jam form and what i wanted was microbiology or biochemistry because then you know we had this life science books that belonged to my dad and we studied and you know there were all these people who worked with microbes in laboratories and who found a cures to diseases and helped to make the world a better place that kind of was what i wanted you know and and then uh, my parents were like uh, how about you do the whole professional course thing you know, or do medicine in a pharmacy, you know, something professional that's going to pay you big bucks. And, well, I agreed. I wasn't paying, you know. <laughs> but then I, I thought it was a good idea. But then we're going to medical school and I was like, okay, uh, I don't think I want to be a doctor. You know, so it's a crazy story, but I end up in an anatomy department and I'm a year away from graduation and I'm thinking to myself, so what next? You know, so I looked at all of the uh, various research fields that uh, people could get into. And what I say to myself was, well, I think I think I'd want to, you know, work in humanitarian situations. I'd want to help people out uh, when when things go really bad. And so while a lot of my uh, colleagues were doing a uh, were doing researches, 
So while a lot of my colleagues were doing research is in areas of, uh, you know, uh, cellular anatomy, uh, they were doing a lot of lab works, sacrificing animals, uh, doing uh, histological studies and all those kinds of stuff. I, I did biological anthropology because then I felt, yeah, you know, that was going to be really useful and would set me up for a career in the development sector. So that's when uh, I started nursing the ideas of going into, uh, you know, community development kind of work. Yeah. So I finished my first research and I was the first, I was, um, so I, I finished my research on, on a concept called comic index and, you know, it was a real, a real good study. I was like the best uh, research student in my class at the time. And I got published in 2009. And yeah, you, you can you can still find my first research online. I think it's published on the Internet Journal of Biological Anthropology. You know, so that was my first uh, research, like my first published uh, research experience, because research is something that has grown to be a part of our lives and our existence. Because we always want to question uh, phenomena that exists in our environment and. I guess uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, since then, I've done a bunch of other researches, uh, a good number of which are not in the public uh, domain. Because uh, when you work in the in the human rights sector and you are working with very vulnerable groups, there are uh, certain researches you conduct that you do not publish uh, because uh, you might be further exposing the vulnerabilities of the the sensitive groups that you work with. So. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's been uh, quite a number of published research and one I'm most proud of would be uh, research we did in 2019 for the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes on illicit, uh... <laughs> oh my God, on illicit use of uh, Kodid and Tramadol in uh, Nigeria, you know, it was like, it was a, it was a large team, but it was a very fantastic experience. And till date, I still conduct, you know, uh, little uh, packets of research uh, that help me understand better uh, the terrains where I work and help me improve the quality of service that I deliver to, you know, all the different groups I work Thank you so much for that, uh, dear Michael. I was reading recently that you collaborate with an organization called 100. Uh, can you explain what it is and uh, how it works? 100 is an international organization that promotes educational innovations across the world. So it's an organization based in Finland, but the impact of their work is felt pretty much everywhere in the world. And what they do is phenomenal because a uh, hundred seeks out local innovations. This could be uh, how teachers in the local school are trying to solve a problem that they have. And now these innovations are all compiled in a platform and then they are laid out in a way that Teachers who are facing similar challenges in other parts of the world can assess these innovations and they can apply them to solve their problems. And that way we can have, you know, more effective, more efficient, more sustainable educational models, not just in some parts of the world where you have better uh, development, but actually everywhere in the world. And uh, that's super, super awesome. So what's my role within 100 Okay, so I'm country lead for Nigeria, and the, the thing is, uh, people can become parts of 100 in many capacities. You know, people could become ambassadors, and you, know, you could be like an ambassador, you could be a youth ambassador if you're like really young. Uh, not, not like the Nigerian idea of youth, where uh, people in their 80s still claim to be youth, you know, like a lot of our politicians know. Uh, you know, youth, people under 24. But probably even people under 18, you know, so really young persons, you know, these are high school kids who are passionate about education and want to make impacts in their schools and in their society. And and then uh, among the ambassadors, you have country leads. And that's where I come in alongside other country leads from uh, different countries across the world. And what we do is uh, network with the ambassadors we have in our country and try to find a way uh, that we can 
uh, collaborate among ourselves, improve the quality of the work we do, and then, of course, share innovations with the global community. So 100 is a really nice organization, and I think uh, it's one of those. All right, Mr. Mike, uh, more than ever before, it has become more important today that as Africans, we champion the telling of our stories. And this should be reflected in everything that we do. What is your take on that? <laughs> so I think of all the questions that you have asked, my friend, this is probably my favorite, yes, because, um, you know, growing up, I've always had this impression that just like, you know, most Africans or most Nigerians that, you know, the world is a real simple place and we're all, you know, the same. Yeah. You know, so uh, I hadn't traveled out of Nigeria and I had not met so many people from so many different countries. And that includes Africans, of course. But uh, until I started traveling and I started realizing that even within the African continents, you know, we have so much that unites us, but then we also have so much that divide us. You know, so uh, it's not the same culture, it's not the same ideologies, it's not the same beliefs, you know, but all of these beliefs collectively are different from what you have in Asia, different from what you have in Europe, different from what you have in America. But then I also realized that the narratives of Africans that you get from different parts of the world are going to be different, you know, so uh, the typical European uh, may not perceive a Nigerian as, you know, the best person to do business. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, there are stereotypes. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I don't want, I don't want to be saying anything, you know. <laughs> I don't want to say, I, I don't want to generalize. That's what I'm trying to make. I don't want to generalize. But we know that there are stereotypes. And uh, a lot of times, uh, a quick Google search, you know, go, go to Quora. Ask if there are Nigerians in, in Italy or in in Germany or in Moscow, wherever, you know, if you read 10 comments, you probably get like seven negative comments. But they're like, yeah, they're Nigerians. Oh, they're really cool. Oh, no, they are scammers. Oh, no, they're frosters. Oh, and so people always try to tell our stories differently. You know, it's like growing up and watching Hollywood movies and the movies always have a theme where uh, you have people who are barbaric and evil and satanic and cannibals. And then the white man comes and saves them or the white man's religion comes and redeems them and, you know, brings them civilization. But that's the narrative a lot of us had growing up. And so, you know, when you go out there in the streets, you're going to hear young people say, ah, our ancestors were bad. Uh, you know, our people were silly. Our people were illiterate. Our people did this and they did that and they did those. And they did. But I, as I grew and I started studying on my own, I started realizing that, man, um, it wasn't all true. Now, uh, cannibalism is not a is not an African word. Cannibalism is an English word, because sometime before the white man found the black people, there were white people who ate other white people. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. You know, it's a concept that they that they had. You know, genocide. Before people talk about genocide in Rwanda, you know, now go to Google, search the word genocide, they're going to find Rwanda. But genocide is an English word because there's been genocides before Rwanda even learned about the concept. Genocide, there were no genocides in Africa in 1945 or between 1917 and 1919 or whatever. You know, we, we didn't have uh, genocides in the Middle Ages. We didn't have genocides in the second century, in the third century. We didn't. But these were reoccurring themes you had across Europe, you know. These people fought for a hundred years, you know, fought a war for a hundred freaking years. So, but they don't tell you about that. So I realized that uh, the European would be quick to tell you what's bad about your culture, but not what's bad about his own culture. He'll tell you what's good about his culture and tell you what's bad about your culture. And uh, the hope is that you can abandon what is truly yours and then embrace what is truly theirs. And that kind of resonates the the saying attributed to Chen Wa Chebe that until the lion learns to write the the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. 
And so unless we learn to tell the African story as a people, we will always suffer. You know, we will, our development will suffer. Our educational system will suffer. Everything is going to suffer as a matter of fact. You know, imagine that you are studying history in Nigeria and then they're going to teach you, okay, that you guys had uh, the Bini Empire, the Kanembarano Empire, and then they'll tell you all oh, the empires fell. And then uh, there was colonization, and then there was independence, and then our history pretty much begins in 1960. Oh, well, some people want to trace it back to 1914 with the amalgamation of the Northern and the Southern Protectorates to create the entity called Nigeria, right? But then uh, the people, the cultures that exist in this entity called Nigeria have always been there for thousands of years. Our ancestors have lived on this land. They had cultures. There were people, you know. But all you hear about that is, oh, there were twin killers until Mary Lesso stopped the killing of twins. Until you did your research, then you realize that Mary Lesso did not actually stop the killing of the twins. A local chief did. You know, what actually happened, you know, from the story I learned. Now, I heard a story in Calabar when I visited the Mary Slayers Island and they showed us what would have been, you know, the place where the, the lady lived. So it turns out that they had this culture where twins were killed in a particular uh, community. It wasn't a widespread uh, culture across Nigeria. This was in Cross River State. Yes. And it so happens that now this chief has this wife who gives birth to a set of twins and he did not want his twins to die. So what did he do? He saved the life of his twins and started mobilizing support to end the killing of twins. Now, Mary Slessor was a missionary who lived in the neighborhood and yes, she did uh, talk about uh, these things and she tried to talk to people about them, but it wasn't her teachings that made the people want to stop it. Is the fact that some powerful persons were affected and they said, okay, enough of this bullshit. Let's stop it right now because they didn't want to lose your kids. You know, so so when the story is told, ah, Mary Slessor, but then what happens to the chief and his collaborators? What happens to all the other uh, locals who held hands and said, you know what, I think we're done with this and they changed the culture. Because then if you understand how cultures change, you know that foreigners don't change cultures. The people change cultures, you know, and you find that across uh, so many different tribes, you know, the, we hear about the fall of the Benin Empire, but would they tell you that the British, you know, robbed and looted the, the British Empire and stole all their stuff, you know, killed their people, men and women and children? Are they going to tell you that history? No. Are they going to tell you that uh, once upon a time that the British in, in, invaded Nembe and they killed men, women and children? No, are they going to tell you that the British killed uh, some of the greatest kings that Africa produced? You know, the likes of King Jaja of Opobo, the likes of uh, Moanga uh, the second. you know, the Kabak of Buganda. Are they going to tell you that uh, the British killed uh, the, the Kabalega of Bunyoro? No, uh, you know, the, the story goes from Zanzibar to South Africa to everywhere in africa they're not going to tell you the atrocities that they have committed are they going to tell you that king leopold killed millions of congolese people because of the natural resources in in their lands that he cut off their arms and their limbs he cut them limb by limb until they died are they going to tell you that no so when a genus when something something that is relatively bad happens in africa everybody's going to hear about it but then when it is perpetrated by the Europeans, then um, no, you're never going to hear about that. So if we're going to tell the history of our people, we have to tell it right. And from our own perspective, the narratives have to change. You know, our people have to uh, learn to talk better about those things because, you know, I think it's, it's enough. You know, we've had enough of all of these censoring of what we study in schools, of what we can read up, the censoring of what we can find online, censoring of what we think and believe about ourselves because it's a death of, you know, real genuine information about who we truly are and what our journey has been. You know, 
one that really drives me crazy is when they say, oh, the African was illiterate and they had to teach them how to read and write. No, our people wrote NCBD. And then NCBD was just one of the ancient writing systems coming out of Africa. Because when you go from culture to culture, from ancient Kush to, to Egypt, come down to sub-Saharan Africa, and we had different writing systems that people used to communicate and some of those writing stems still exist still today and so when people say, eh, they were illiterate and we taught them how to write lies lies all lies and so uh, i i think <laughs> i think we, we we need to start working on those narratives and and changing them because it, it's it's really crazy you know it really is crazy i understand that you have a project that you are currently pushing out through which you are rendering a service to the people around you. And this project is actually called Service. Can you explain what that means and how do you operate? Service is an acronym that means Society for Empowering Vulnerable Individuals, Communities and Systems and is a non-profit that I founded in 2017. Well, uh, it's always been a small organization and there are chances it's going to stay that way uh, because... Uh, you know, having worked in the development sector for a while and uh, having worked with a lot of persons, I personally believe, and it's in line with, uh, you know, a research that I have done, that sometimes interventions that target single individuals will always be more effective than uh, researches that target, you know, uh, thousands or millions of people at once. You know, it's like making medical doctors. You, you want to have uh, great medical doctors. You're going to realize that, okay, yeah. So when you're having the general courses, you have maybe 100 persons in the room. But at the time they become doctors, you know, you have just a couple of them. By the time they're having their residency, you just have, you know, maybe a handful of persons. And the higher up they go in their training, the more exclusive the trainings become because uh, there they're, are... Um, life-changing principles you can give out to you know so many people at the same time sometimes having that personal touch that one-on-one -on -one contact might be all you need to affect the change you want in in your society so so civics is a local non-profit in nigeria and i don't know maybe sometime in the future all right sometime in the future but currently speaking all the services that you render are free of charge so, uh, well, First Service is a non-profit organization, and that implies that a lot of the services that we provide to the community would be relatively free. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that, to a very large extent, the community won't have to, you know, pay for uh, the services if we're, if we're able to find other persons who would foot the bill, you know, for one. And if, for some reason, they have to pay for the services we provide, it would be at a very discounted rate, yeah? So, Cervix tries to work with young people in a number of areas, and first would be education. Uh, theory is this. Education has to be any knowledge that empowers a person. So, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, classroom knowledge of biology and the cell and all those kinds of stuff, you know, like I used to teach uh, some time back. But now we're looking at uh, skills people can make money out of, skills that help them become uh, better people, you know. So it could be uh, workplace skills. It could be some hard skills that you can make money from, like podcasting, you know, like content creation. You know, we teach blogging, how to write, uh, how to start your podcasts. Uh, we teach people about uh, YouTube and, you know, generally, you know, content creation and those kinds of stuff because uh, that is something I am convinced can help anyone get started from where they are using whatever resources they have at their disposal. You know, look at the content creation space. People are talking about everything, you know, about the life in a village, about swimming, about fishing, about famine, you know. There is nothing you make content on and people aren't going to love it, you know. People are going to love uh, whatever you put out there and I'm thinking, so we have a pretty interesting life here in Nigeria. So showcase a bit of what you have and improve your chances of 
making money. Yeah. Okay. So uh, th that's on the one part. But then uh, we also look at a society that is safe for everyone to live in. So we think that if more people are engaged in doing uh, meaningful stuff, there would be uh, fewer opportunities for them to get into trouble. And the other thing that uh, we try to do is this. I've come to look at the non-profit space and in line with, uh, you know, my desire to provide as much organizational support as I possibly can. You know, we brought this also into Cevix. So we have the organizational or what we call the corporate support services as uh, one of the main things that we provide. So it could be in form of uh, strategy development or in training or sometimes you know helping organizations to brainstorm to find their place in the community because i think there are so many non-profits in nigeria but then a good number of them have very little idea of what they are doing because you know the research capabilities are not so good uh, the organizational development uh, opportunities are not so much. There, there aren't enough grants for nonprofits to use for their work, and th that is simply because there are so many organizations competing for very limited resources. And even in more recent times, uh, with COVID nineteen and all that's happened in the financial, in the global financial space, uh, th there isn't so much uh, resources for people to use for their work anymore. So. Uh, what we're doing at Cevix is helping organizations improve uh, their visibility, uh, provide training opportunities, organizational capacity assessment opportunities, and all of that. I think uh, these are the two areas where we want to focus now because, you know, initially we wanted to do, you know, recreation, wanted to do health and all that. But right now we're narrowing down our work to uh, two main uh, items, and that's going to be coming out in the new strategic plan. Uh, that we are working on, you know, so it's going to be education and organizational capacity uh, development. And these are going to be like uh, the two key things we're going to be focusing on in the within the next five years, I think, starting from uh, later this year or early next year. Yeah, so we want to be the non-profits, non-profits. And uh, you, you're going to find that uh, and you're going to see and you're going to see a lot of the projects that we're developing in more recent times keen into, uh, you know, this, this idea, into this ideology. You know, there is the peer ed, uh, which is going to launch very soon. Uh, but the other exciting one that is actually in line right now is the Gold Coast. So Gold Coast is for nonprofits. And I think it's going to be probably the first uh, directory sites we're going to have for nonprofits in Africa and we're going to call on all nonprofits from across Africa and even uh, nonprofits of African origins, but maybe operate in the diaspora. They can all come sign up there and that would help uh, bring more visibility to nonprofits across Africa. That would help uh, them find uh, partners that can also help them, you know, share the work, the impact that they're creating in the society. And it's also a very good opportunity for uh, beneficiary groups to give feedback on the work that their nonprofits are doing. So it's still work in progress, but then the site is up and um, organizations can go now, you know, uh, create accounts and sign up. So those are, you know, kind of like a few of the stuff we do at Cervix and Thank you so much for that. Uh, now, who would you say service was created to serve? I mean, who are your audience, the, your main audience? So, Cervix is a nonprofit that was formulated to create an enabling environment for African youth to achieve the greatest potentials, you know, in all facets of life. And we're looking to achieve that through promoting education, promoting uh, academic achievement. You know, uh, you know, through promoting education, improving academic achievements, improving uh, technical skills, individual competencies and capabilities. You know, we also looked at promoting health and then the institutions that support uh, all of this. And then we're also looking at recreation, you know, as a very important path to uh, youth development. But uh, 
all of that were at the point of a foundation but like i said previously right now we're only looking to promote education and to promote uh, and to and to promote you know healthy operations among other nonprofits that provide these services because uh, we've come to learn that no one organization can provide enough services to help everyone but a lot of times there isn't enough support for all the organizations that want to uh, work in the sector and to provide these services to you know all the different groups that they work with whether they are young people um, elderly persons members of the lgbtq community you know uh, childbearing mothers or just about any other group you can think about Thank you so much for this amazing sharing there, Michael. Now, for people that want to connect with you, how would they do that? Do you have any presence online, the website or anything? Please share with them. So there are a bunch of ways I can be reached. First, you can send an email to Michael at cervix.org or you can send the organization an, an email at uh, cervixng at gmail.com. Okay, but if you wanted to connect on other social media platforms, uh, you can reach me on Instagram at Michael Okuma. Actually, it's Michael Okuma on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and pretty much everywhere else. Well, on LinkedIn, yeah, still Michael Okuma. And if you wanted to reach our organization across social media platforms, it would be at Cevix Africa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate our review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead everyone for. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.